mind and could produce machines that defy our wishes. We are heading, he wrote, to an industrial revolution of unmitigated cruelty. Do you want to hazard a guess as to who wrote those remarks and when? I'm sure you're going to tell me it was somebody in either 1970 or 1930 or maybe in the first industrial revolution. It was Norbert Wiener in 1949 who was regarded as the father of cybernetics. And he certainly was way ahead of his time in many regards. But do you think he was just premature in what he was saying? Or do you think that there is a cyclicality of this argument that every few generations we worry that mass automation is going to put us all out of jobs and then we realize that it doesn't because new jobs are created? So there has been a cyclical tendency for people to fear massive widespread unemployment and it hasn't happened yet. We're pretty much at full employment in the UK and the US. And (laughs) Bean is an interesting character. Apparently he wasn't a terribly nice man. And if it wasn't for that, artificial intelligence would be called cybernetics but the people who invented the science of AI gathered in a room, made sure he wasn't there and gave it a different name I think he was ahead of his time past rounds of automation have been mechanisation so there are no horses working on farms anymore and horses, those horses they got dead frankly You know, they got very seriously made redundant what we have coming, and it's only just beginning, is widespread cognitive automation we've had some, so secretaries were very common when I started work and now they're pretty much extinct because they got automated if you like by Microsoft Windows, Microsoft uh, Office and so on. Bank tellers have also largely been automated out of existence but there are many job categories that those people could go into. It's important to note we didn't invent new jobs. Most people working today are doing jobs which existed in 1900. What we've done is we've expanded many of the existing categories of work but when cognitive automation really takes hold then those categories will be filled up with machines and we won't have any place in them. Now I think where we know was definitely wrong is the idea that it has to be a cruel world of unemployment. I think it would be crazy if we have machines creating all this wealth and we can't somehow find a way to turn that into a great world where humans can get on with the important things in life which are learning and playing and having adventures and having fun while the machines do the jobs. That that should be a great world. Part of the argument counter to what you're saying is that We can see the jobs that are going to be destroyed, as you're saying, drivers are likely to have quite a short shelf life over the next two decades or so, but we are completely hopeless at trying to predict what are the jobs are going to be in the future. So there was a big McKinsey report came out the other day that, like you, was stressing that there's a very high probability that jobs in many fields are going to be automated away. But they were a lot more optimistic than you about the possibility of creating jobs in new areas. And... Twitch, for example, we're now employing people to make video films about people watching computer games. Now, you, no one would have thought that that would have been a job that... Years ago, Microsoft are now hiring what they call empathologists, which was not a job category in the Bureau of Labor Statistics a few years ago. So there are new, unimagined forms of work that we are going to create for ourselves. Do you buy this argument? No, there is this idea that the magic jobs drawer will fly open and all these new jobs will pop out and we can't tell you what they are now because the technologies that will enable them haven't yet been invented. That isn't what happened in the past. As I said earlier, 90% of people working today are doing jobs which existed in 1900. If you go down the list of the Bureau of Labor Statistics job, you have to go to about number 23 before you get to a new job. So user experience architects and web designers and so on. There are times on the top of the workforce. That may change. It may be that machines will enable us to create. of new types of jobs there's no particular reason to think that that will happen and to rely on it happening so that we forget about planning for the consequences if it doesn't happen would be a very very dangerous thing to do right so let's assume that you're right we are heading to a world of technological unemployment what can we do about it you're saying that we can restructure our societies to cope for this new world what do you think needs to be done 
So the solution that people tend to leap to is universal basic income, which is a nice idea. It's the idea that every citizen gets a, a basic income regardless of their needs as of right because they're a citizen. There's a fundamental problem with it, which is that it's basic. If all we can do when say, half the population is unemployed is give them a basic income, then we have failed morally, but more importantly, society will collapse. It won't survive. So we have to do a lot better than that. And the only way to do better than that is to reduce the price of all the goods and services that you need for a very good standard of living down to close to zero. I don't think we should go all the way to zero because then you would lose the power of the market. The market is a terrific mechanism for resource allocation. But if we make everything very cheap, then the people who are still working, and I think until we get to super intelligence, some people will still be working. Plus, there'll be some people, mostly Google and Facebook, who own a lot of assets. We can tax those people without the taxes being punitive to pay for everybody else to have access to a really great standard of life and not to have to do jobs. I think people will always work. People will always have projects and schemes that they're working on. They just won't get paid for them. And you think it's possible to fund that? I mean, I think the Cato Institute did a study of if you provide all Americans with a basic income of $12,000 a year, it costs you about $4 trillion, which is one heck of a lot of money. Yes, all the attempts to justify funding UBI in the current sort of economic circumstances are a bit of a fudge. And the RSA has done it. There was quite a bit of work done on it in France at the time of the last election. But they've missed the connection, which is that if you reduce the price of all the goods and services close to zero, then it is affordable, not universal basic income. Actually, I think the other problem with UBI is that it's universal. If we have, say, a society in which three quarters of humans are not doing jobs, but one quarter are, why on earth would you pay a UBI to the quarter that are? They will presumably be earning very good livings. So is it achievable to drive the costs down to so low? And I think it is. And I think if you look at a few sectors one by one, you can see how it can happen. As I said earlier, it wasn't previously at all affordable to have access to all the music that you might ever want to listen to. And now it's £10 a month. And then take the transportation sector. So at the moment, taxis, for instance, have human drivers, expensive. They are powered by internal combustion engines, which have got lots of moving parts, little explosions going on all over the place, and the fuel is expensive. Convert them all to electric, make the electricity nearly free, which, because of the sharply declining cost in solar-generated electricity, it will be in 20 to 30 years. It is not cost-competitive at the moment, despite what the Greens tell us, but it will be. So if you have cars all self-driven and electric and powered by nearly free electricity, transportation could become really, really cheap. There is a, an agricultural college in the UK which has tilled, sown, cultivated and harvested a crop without any human intervention. So again, agriculture, food production could become very, very cheap. I think it's doable. But here's the thing. We need a plan for how we're going to get from here to there. And the reason why we need a plan is A, so that we can do it. But more importantly, so we can reassure everybody that it's going to happen. Because somewhere in the next 10 years, everybody's going to wake up to what's happening. And the subtitle of your book is Artificial Intelligence and the Death of Capitalism, which is a pretty bold statement. But you think that the world that we're moving into is more kind of matching supply and demand without necessarily the market acting as an intermediating function, do you? No, I think the world we've been talking about so far, where you have, say, three quarters of humans not employed, but living a very good standard of living paid for by taxes on those who are still working and those who have assets, that's not in my mind, the end of capitalism, because I do think we can retain the market at that point and therefore retain the excellent resource allocation distribution mechanism that it provides. But then there's a later phase when that world has stabilised. You then have three quarters of the population earning or receiving very much the same income and living a very egalitarian life. But there's this other group who are still working or who have lots of assets. And because technology hasn't slowed down, they start to drift apart because the previously very effective mechanism for disseminating technology, you know, the smartphones are 10 years old and now there are more smartphones in Uganda than light bulbs apparently. It's accelerating so fast that there just isn't time to disseminate it so that the wealthier people, they speciate, they become quite different. And we know from history that when you have two groups of people which are very different, the weak group doesn't tend to do very well. So where is this plan? going to come from. You're talking about a different species of ultra-wealthy who are clearly not going to be too interested in 
pushing forward a plan. You've got governments at the moment in this country who are obsessed by Brexit in America, they want to build walls or obsessing about Rocket Man in North Korea. In Europe, we're worrying about the kind of invasion of technology, the 